thank you. Um, hopefully my presentation will work today. What's interesting for me is that I hear a lot of talk about what we call the denial machine. And for me, that's, if you look at their strategies, like I've been looking at it for the past several years, that's 20%, maybe, of their process. If you look at where their actual money goes, a lot of it goes into what I consider to be positive corporate propaganda to foster the continued use of fossil fuels in the economy. And so, although a lot of analysis has looked at attacks on scientific information, and it's not surprising that climate scientists being the subject of those attacks would want to focus on that. That's when you take dollar for dollar and you look at it, most of the money, and I would say probably 80% of the money that the fossil fuel corporations utilize to influence public opinion and, and political action goes much more into their into what I consider to be their positive corporate propaganda. So, the oil industry has a rather long and jaded history of a bad corporate as a bad corporate actor, starting in 1904 with Ida Tarbell's book, Standard Oil of New Jersey, the fossil fuel industry has been seen as a rapacious, polluting, and greedy industry over the, over the entire century. And they've been laboring to get out of that, out of that image since then. And over on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of the, the, the person on the right is Ivy Lee. He's considered to be the father of modern public relations. He went to work for the Rockefellers and was instrumental in the first sort of public relations of getting John D. Rockefeller to look like a good guy because he gave out dimes. That was one of his ideas. But there he is. He's, he's pictured there. Um, with the president of Standard Oil of New Jersey, which is now known as ExxonMobil, when they were planning and developing the, the, the development of the American Petroleum Institute in 1919. So we're coming on the 100th anniversary of the creation of one of the first major trade associations informed by modern public relations. And it was Ivy Lee's ideas that were incorporated into the, into the American Petroleum Institute and as and a lot of American Petroleum Institute is really one of the first modern PR agencies. And it was, it was in, so the public relations industry has been grown up in concert with the fossil fuel industry. Now, through the, through the 30s and the 40s, there, there was a lot of sort of positive PR uh, associated with, with the fossil fuel industry, mostly run by um, the American Petroleum Institute. But then starting in the 70s and 80s, that's when Mobile got going under the guise of a guy named Herb Schmertz. And what he developed, he developed three major tactics that the fossil fuel industry developed. The first thing was that the Mobile, Mobile Oil Company was really, really instrumental in pushing all the way through to the, to the Supreme Court the rights of corporate speech is that in 1978, in the first National Bank of Boston versus Filotti, that that was when the Supreme Court said corporations have the right to free speech just like everybody else. Before that, they had to have cons they, you were allowed to constrict corporate speech. This gave them corporate speech rights, which was a very very big win for corporations. The second initiative of Mobile Oil was, and I'm probably sure there's people in this room that have seen them, were the, were the advertorials in the, in, the, in the New York Times that they ran from 1970 to 88. And the third thing was, and this is really an interesting thing, is, is their mobile started out sponsoring uh, Masterpiece Theater. And the idea behind this kind of sponsorship, and now you see it everywhere, you know, corporations put their names on museums all over the place, uh, or, you know, high quality TV, is it's called the affinity of purpose advertising, is that you associate a corporation with a high prestige cultural institution, which means the cultural institution aids in the reputation of mobile oil. So mobile oil gains its, in its reputation. So, so 
this has been a, 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 a long-standing process. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Kirk Davies and the Center for uh, the Climate uh, <coughs> Investigation Center right over there got hold of one of their internal assessments of what Mobile Oil thought about what they accomplished with their public relations program. And what's really interesting is they make two two kind of bald-faced claims in this thing. This one is that they say that they shifted the editorial stance of the New York Times. And they claim so, and they provide several you know, pages of documentation of how they shifted the editorial process. The other and a more insidious one, which is I find, is that they argue that they were responsible, or at least contributed to the American shift to the right by seeding their ideas, and these are their words, collective unconscious of the American public. And so this is really a highly sophisticated campaign drawing on the work of Freud, which is played into the public relations literature and things like that. So, so this kind of process, it's not denying science. It's fostering public opinions that are favorable to the continuation, continued use of fossil fuels. So this matured after the 70s and 80s into the sort of the, the idea of what, what we call the corporate promotion industry. This is a big deal in public relations. And, and the idea of these, um, and, and virtually all corporations do this. There's, there's, you know, it's not like saying that, you know, you can even see wind energy. Citibank has a nice commercial out about how wonderful they are. They put up some wind um, but what it really involves is the skillful use of corporate propaganda. This is propaganda. Make no mistake about it. Um, that it works, it works to try to, the first thing it does is it tries to connect the corporation and its image with the idea of, you know, first of all, we're good corporate citizens. And that it, it involves identifying the corporation with the ideas of the good life, progress, prosperity, and rationality, all wrapped up in this one corporate image. And what this does is, first of all, it fosters and improves their corporate reputation, which really pays real dividends on the stock market. But the other thing is that it, it works to offset possible action that's adverse. If that what we find is that the corporations with a bad reputation have a much higher probability of getting regulated. So if you're all good actors, you're all responsible citizens. There's no need to regulate you. So, so uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to let the data speak for themselves. Is that if, if I can get it to work? Here's Exxon Mobil's latest one. And I think I just pushed this to make it go. Where there's life, where there's progress, there's energy. As the world grows, the need for energy grows too. And ExxonMobil is playing a big role in providing it, making advantaged investments in different corners of the world, growing production, providing jobs, building new facilities, and upgrading others to make high-value products, creating shareholder value and driving economic development all around the world. And we're working on ways to provide energy while addressing the risks of climate change, producing clean burning natural gas to reduce emissions from power plants, capturing CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere, and exploring unexpected energy sources like biofuels made from algae. We're also investing in ways you might not expect. Helping communities prevent malaria. Empowering women to grow their incomes. And supporting education. Energy. It powers our lives today, and it's the key to tomorrow. And no one is more committed to providing it than the people of ExxonMobil. Energy lives here. Run 
that four or five thousand bucks. <laughs> Okay, this is what this is the kind of thing that we're we're dealing with. So, so the question we asked in, in the paper we did is, how much do they really spend on this stuff? So we looked at it. Went to, what I went to is there. You can't get all of the data. What what you can get is you can get how much advertising buys they spend their money on. So we went to the, this Kentar Media database, which allows you to download how much actual advertising buys they bought. Doesn't include production, doesn't include anything else. And this is what we got. Virtual, first of all, virtually every major oil company, and here's the five that we, we looked at, has a major corporate promotion program. And with the, when we looked at the spending, in total for these, we, got, we did finally get 30 years, um, so we could run some regressions. Um, 3.6 billion dollars total across these years. Average annual expenditure is 120 million, with a peak of 315 million dollars in 2010. Hmm, what was happening in 2010? We're having legislation. Okay, so we set up a nice little regression. Here's our path model uh, for those of you who care about this. But uh, what we did is we looked at three independent variables, which was level of congressional activity on climate change. Major oil spills, which usually makes sense because they have a big oil spill, they've got to fix their corporate reputation. Or did major scientific reports like the IPCC or the National Climate Assessment have any difference? We thought about looking through uh, intermediate areas of uh, media coverage through climate change, and then finally public concern over climate change. Those of you saying the IRF should go the other way around, we did major causality to look at the analysis of, of statistical effects. So we did that. Here's the results. Public opinion drops out, scientific reports drop out. They don't really have any anything to do with what corporations spend on public on, on their corporate expenditures. The big drive, both directly and indirectly, <coughs> is what the Senate and the House do. That it, it looks like there's going to be legislation, there's going to be hearings on it, they start pouring it up. Okay, so Green New Deal, that gets more expensive. We're going to see increases in this. BP just came out with its latest campaign, I think, two days ago. So we so we would predict it. Um, okay. Oh, I got two minutes. Oh, well, I got a little like conclusion. So 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 you know, I got uh, four takeaway points here. First of all, is that corporate actions to oppose climate action aren't just climate denial and misinformation but that the clever use of corporate propaganda and corporate promotion is one of their other strategies, and probably their biggest. This is where the big money goes. When you say $100 million in a year, or $200 million in a year, that's a lot of money. Um, the, the, other, the other problem for this is that the environmental groups have no equipment. I've never seen you know, a Greenpeace or Sierra Club ad run, but you'll probably see these kind of ads on the Super Bowl. Okay, I'm sure Exxon will probably buy some space and API will buy some space. And finally, we don't really know what this does. What does looking at 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 of these ads do cumulatively do to public opinion and concern about climate change? If you look at what ExxonMobil just did, you know, there's no problem. Everything's on the way. We're solving the area. We're dealing with climate change. I mean, Senator, you don't have to do anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so much better. Yeah, so much more confident. So, so I, I, I'm going to leave you, and I wanted to do this, and I'm going to run one minute over because I know it takes too much to run this film. But, mm -hmm. but for me, what, what's really amazing is that I did find a study that talks about PR, the, the PR professionals doing papers for other PR people say, you think that there's problems with cynicism about your corporate promotion ads? Well, you're probably right. Here's how you get around that. Okay, this is the kind of study that PR professionals do, is that you use stirring music and videos, uh, uh, and stirring music and images, and, and, and so what, what, what I'm going to show you here is probably the penultimate <coughs> manipulation of public opinion. You know, it must have cost, they probably did what, a, minute, uh, a million dollars for every 10 seconds on this thing because it's so, this is the American Petroleum Institute's video 
that I've showed to a couple of classes and it's just left the students agog that this could be done this well. So I'm going to leave you with this, if it runs. <coughs> pushing the boundary of what the oil and gas industry has seen. We drilled a lot of wells through several years of development here on the Durham Ranch. At this point now, when we have depleted the wells, we've actually plugged and abandoned those wells and we're looking at the reclaimed landscape behind us. Pipelines truly are the safest mode of transportation for oil and natural gas. You get a lot of product from point A to point B and we're able to do it very safely. He's been able to get this plastic so thin and so light. When I put it on, it, ju it just feels normal. And I can swing it perfectly fine from hip to knee, and it just works great. We want to show our communities that we care. We want to show our communities that we're doing our part to mitigate or minimize emissions to the environment.